Good evening, Saints. Um, I had to look back twice to see if somebody else was going to come up, but I guess it's me. Um, so how's everybody doing tonight? Good to see everyone. It's been a blessing, and um, you know, God is good all of the time. And all of the time, God is certainly good. He's been good to me, and I know he's been good to you as well. So, you know, it's just a lot of blessings that we give all the Almighty God the credit for all how He has blessed our lives and as He continue to bless us as we continue to live, move, have our very being while we're still on earth. There are so many good stories uh, that we have heard and we want to also share, you know, and, um, you know, I can't, not stress this enough is that God is good Amen. all the time. I cannot say that enough. He has been good. And you know, we have uh, Brother Stephen Ozan. When I think back at the previous weeks, uh, he was in the hospital. He, you know, he yeah. sick and a lot of pain, and he'd been taken to the emergency center. And and look at look at God go to work. Look at him now. He's he's back Praise with God. us. And this is the anticipated Amen. time we have waited uh for him to come back. Amen. I know he can't wait to get uh back up here to preach and to continue his mission, his work that he uh he enjoys doing and he's Amen. consistently, continuously doing faithfully. And so it is an exciting time, you know, to see how there's nothing that's impossible for God that he can't do for us. Right. All we have to do is just believe and know and have faith, knowing that he is with us and he will deliver us out of the situation that we find ourselves in. Amen. So thank you, Jesus. Amen. Tonight, I want to thank uh, Brother Ozan for the scripture that was read in our hearing, uh, Matthew chapter 8. Verses 23 through 27, and the title of the lesson tonight for this evening's message is A Great Tempest Arose on the Sea. What did the disciples do? Again, a great tempest arose on the sea. What did the disciples do? Again, that's Matthew chapter 8. As our brother has read before our hearing this evening, Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27, for the evening's message. And the Bible says, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest. Now, for those who you may not know what that word tempest uh, means. It is a whirlwind. Yeah. That's what it means. It's a whirlwind. And it says, um, inasmuch that the ship was covered, it's, excuse me, let me go back. It says, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, inasmuch that the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him, saying, Save us, we perish. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm, but the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him. You know, now, in order to get uh, a gist of the, the story, we would have to read the entire context of the entire, uh, you know, scripture. We have to read the whole chapter to really get and grasp uh, to understand the whole entire story. So we're going to start off 
reading the entire chapter of the book of Matthew. Now, Matthew, who was also one of Jesus' disciples, he gives his own gospel account of the life of Jesus. Matthew, uh, being a Jew, a disciple of Jesus, had to spend some time with Jesus to witness some of the things that Jesus had done. Mm -hmm. The evidence is, is found in the scriptures of what we can read. So we get a gist of the story. After Jesus came down from the mountain, the great multitudes followed him. So everywhere Jesus went, he drew large crowds. And it's nothing that is not uncommon. They immediately knew who Jesus was. No questions asked. Many of them needed healing. And not only they knew who Jesus was, but what he could do for them and did do for them. Amen. All of the miracles that, that he demonstrated, that he did, demonstrated his miraculous powers. Look at Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. And we will commence at verse number 18. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I'm using this scripture here to point out that Jesus has received all power in heaven and in earth from his Father. Because it says, is given unto me. Both in the spiritual and the physical Jesus has all power. So going back to Matthew chapter 8, the story continues. Jesus performed miracles after coming down from the mountains. In the ver verses here, the beginning verses, before we get to verse 23, which is the highlight of the lesson, in verse 2 of Matthew chapter 8, Verse 2, it says, Behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing that, if you are now, uh, excuse me, willing, you can make me clean. Now, here is a, a man in desperate need of help. You know, you have a lot of homeless, uh, destitute in, in areas, you know, all over Houston and other parts of, of, of town as well that are in constant need of, of help. You know, you see them on the streets, you know, there's it's no getting around it, there's no getting away from it, you know, they're just everywhere. And, you know, how could you, you know, pass up the opportunity, you know, to help someone if, if you're, if you're uh, more fortunate than they are, why wouldn't you want to help them, you know? And, uh, but there are some people in this world are selfish, only concerned about themselves. And, and their own uh, needs and not understanding and knowing that they themselves can be in that situation. You never know. So, but some of them don't care. They won't even bother to help them saying that's not my problem. I don't, that's not me. I'm not in that situation. So I don't care about that person. Let them suffer by themselves. But you also have to be careful of who you help. You know, ask questions. Assess the situation. You know, some of them, 
may have other intentions that is not good. A person could be sitting on, on the corner collecting all your hard-earned money. You feel sorry for some of them, so you are compelled to help them. But some of these individuals are pretty slick. You know, they can, they can put on rugged clothes and make themselves look like they're homeless. Yeah. And may have a, a BMW parked somewhere out of sight. You never know. So you have to be, you know, careful of who you help. Uh, so you never know. So many are poor and are in desperate need. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 26, in verse 11, for you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. You know, as long as we live on this earth, we will always be among the poor, those less fortunate than us. So this problem we will never go away even after we're gone. You will always have the poor, the population of the poor, destitute, all kinds of problems that they have, is never going to get any better, but it will continue to get worse. But we're talking about a man with leprosy who not only came to Jesus for help, but he worshipped him. Now, Jesus never had to sit and wonder, should I help this, this leper or not? He simply just did it. No question is that he just did it. He saw the need to help those who came to him for help. Amen. So he didn't turn them away. He helped many of them that came to him. Now, leper, leprosy, by definition, is a chronic, curable, infectious disease, mainly causing skin lesions and nerve damage. So you can only imagine how much attention, you know, let's say you see a man walking down the street and he has leprosy. Imagine how much attention he would draw without even trying to get attention. It just you have a lot of people are curious. They see sores. This man is full of sores and have all kinds of lumps on the skin and lesions everywhere. You know, gonna uh, draw attention because people are gonna be curious. You know, like what 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 is going on? You know, Amen. many onlookers. Some with would even look with disgust. Mm -hmm. Others with concerns about their own health. Yeah. If they had no knowledge of what leprosy is and that it is a contagious disease. But it's very unlikely to see a person here in Houston with leprosy. You know, you hear stories of an outbreak of dealing with diseases uh, deadly diseases throughout some countries that are, you know, poor nations, uh, countries, India, uh, you know, many other countries, uh, some parts of Africa, you know, very poor countries that are in extreme poverty with little to no resources. You know, so leprosy was a, a terrible disease during the times of the Old Testament. I want to give a quick example of a king who also was a leper. Uh, look at Second Chronicles chapter 26. Second Chronicles chapter 26 and begin reading at verse number 21. The Bible says, King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house 
of the Lord. Now, Uzziah accomplished many great things. He was uh, made king at 16 years old, king of Judah, who he reigned as king for 52 years in Jerusalem. He built towers. He had plenty of livestock. He had a lot going for, you know, for him. Just a, a few things, you know, listed here. But his heart was lifted up to his destruction. There was a problem that he had. It was pride. He had a prideful heart that led him to sin against God. He transgressed against God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. It was only for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are to consecrate, to burn an incense. It was not for Uzziah to do such a task. Amen. But he did it anyway. And he had no authorization from God to, to do it. He took it upon himself to do something that he wasn't authorized to do. God never even commanded him to do that. But his pride got in the way of that. And he was punished by God. We're going to read later to find out he was punished in the worst way because of what he did. But he trespassed by being in the sanctuary. He wasn't even supposed to be there. So he gets no honor from God for what he has done, but punishment for sin. Leprosy broke out on his forehead. When all of the priests realized that he was leprous, they forced him out. He was struck by the Lord, inflicted with leprosy, and suffered with it until his death. So the Lord allowed the outbreak to come upon him, and we can see how contagious this disease was during that time. Because the Bible says he dwelt in an isolated house. Yes. You know, when you're isolated, that means you're separated from everybody. You know, and, you know, it makes me think about, the, you know, COVID. When COVID hit, yeah. you know, it affected many relationships, you know. Um, some relationships didn't last, you know, during COVID. You know, you would think that that would be a time to, you know, you draw closer to your, your mate, spend more time, you know, with your mate, you know, and, and all of that. But sometimes, you know, there's a lot of stress during yeah. the period of COVID. You know, uh, a lot of things change because of the, there's a gap of time, you know, in between. And, and you know, when, and what happens when people are under duress, a lot of stress, things happen. They want to engage in things that they shouldn't be, you know, engaging in if they're not married. You know, some of them want to have sex to relieve the stress. That's right. You know, if they're not married, I would say if they're not married because of the stress. The stress builds up, the tension builds up, and your body, the hormones get to kicking in. You're bored. You're sitting at home. You're, you're enclosed. You don't want to get out and go anywhere because you're afraid to get sick. You don't want to be close to anybody. But this leper, this king, Uzziah, had to be isolated. So it, it was a very dreadful disease during that time, very deadly disease, contagious. So he had to be isolated. And he had to remove himself out of that 
place quickly because of what the Lord put upon him of him being leprous because of his sin. And so it's a reminder that God is serious about sin. Yeah. And we should never think for one moment that we can sin against God without receiving punishment. Amen. You know, God determines how he's going to punish, you know, punish you for sin. You don't know when the punishment is going to come your way. That's right, preacher. But you, you're not going to escape from it one way or another. It's going to come. So, you know, it's better to let God punish you now to remind you to stop sinning, get on the right track, Repent of the sin and don't turn back. Will you continue in it? You know, then the Holy Spirit gets quenched to where it will leave you because it cannot dwell in an unclean temple. That's right. Your temple is, you know, what's inside of you. And to have Christ's Spirit in you, you have to be clean for Him to dwell there. Otherwise, He's going to leave. He will leave because that's not a place he wants to dwell. He doesn't desire to dwell if the inside is not clean. So that spirit will leave. So, you know, you don't want to have that relationship between you and God be ruined because of your sin. So, but this king, Uzziah, suffered tremendously being afflicted with leprosy. But, so this is one biblical example of that. Now, if you look at Numbers chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 14, two chapters that gives reference in regards to leprosy. In Numbers chapter 13, the entire chapter of Numbers chapter 13. Now, there's a distinction between these two chapters, we can see that Numbers chapter 13 deals with, there's a closely, how a leper is being closely examined. There's just examine, you know, to, as to what would pro, pronounce him clean and what would pronounce him to be unclean. And the other chapter deals with the cleansing of a leper, being cleansed, who, you know, from healing. That's the difference between the two chapters. So when we look at Numbers 13, they had lepers were being closely examined, you know, the sores from sores, legions, hair, skin, you know, to make sure that this is not a complete leprosy. You know, are there any things that would be looked at as leprosy and not assume or, or to have any second guessing is this a leopard case or is it something that looks like leprosy so you know the thing is when when doctors um, they do an evaluation they you know, have to run tests they have to um, do a lot of testing and doing blood work because they want to get an accurate finding to make sure this is exactly what they find in the body, you know. Um, and one thing about blood work is that your blood work is going to really tell you exactly everything that's going on inside your body, just the blood work. All they have to do is take a sample of your blood, and it, it tells them a lot. 
whether you have diabetes, whether you have cancer, heart disease, all those things, you know, and so, but in today's time, it's totally different than it was during the times of the Old Testament, you know, they didn't have all those things that we have in the modern world today, so they used what they could to assess uh, every case when it comes to diseases and things of that nature, so, but one is for closely examining detail by detail. The other chapter deals with the cleansing of leprosy. So I just wanted to point those two chapters out. Um, but to continue, the healing continues from verses 5 all the way to verse 17. Jesus continues to heal those who came to him that had a need. It says, verse 18, it says, And Jesus saw a great multitude about him. He gave a command to depart to the other side. Then a centurion scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow everywhere you go. And Jesus saw, uh, said, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head. Now, you know, imagine that, you know, um, you know, during Jesus' earthly ministry, you know, he would, he would travel different places, you know, um, performing miracles and doing, you know, other great works. But he he didn't have a permanent place to you know to you know like like you and I you know we have a permanent dwelling place we go every night you know we come home from work we don't have to worry about where we're gonna stay the next day one day to the next we have a dwelling place a permanent place you know until we decide to move somewhere else you know but it's a it's a temporary place uh you know if we're renting or something like that we consider it our dwelling place if we paying rent live in an apartment town home you know you're renting it for however long 12 months 6 months you consider that your temporary dwelling place you continue to extend the lease you still have a, be a dwelling place you have a place to go but Jesus had no place to lay his head yes. no place but he slept wherever he could, you know. And so in this case here, his disciples follow him as he gets on a boat. And he sleeps in a little, more like an attachment, a tip of the boat, where Jesus slept in that part of the boat. But it says... But the Son of Man have no word to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Yes. So why are you worried about that rather than following me? Just follow me. Don't worry about that part. Just follow me. Jesus wants him to follow him. Because following him is, is much more important than anything else. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Then the disciples came to him and awake him, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. But he said to them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. 
So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even that the sea obey him? Now here Jesus, you know, has no place to lay his head, like I mentioned before, no permanent dwelling place to call his home. He rests and sleeps whenever the opportunity suited him, especially on a long journey. In this case here, he's sleeping in the boat. The waves is raging high. When these waves covered the boat, what did the disciples do? They came to Jesus and awoke him out of fear for the Lord to save them. Yeah. They're fearing for their life. You know, many of us will never forget how one Thursday night of 2024 a very strong winds, heavy rainfall, sleep have such a huge impact. There's a uh, trees being uprooted out of the ground, power outages, some intersection lights are still out. Yeah. Many people get into panic mode in situations like this. You know, that's what happens. And um, as I recall, when I was at work Thursday night, I think I did look at the TV news. I don't really watch TV that much, you know, because the uh, only time I watch it is when I want to see the news report and kind of, you know, keep track of that before I leave. And I did see a weather advisory that said, um, a tornado warning. I guess I didn't pay attention to it. So I went to work. Went outside earlier at work. It was wet outside, you know. By the time I was leaving, getting ready to head back on 59 to go to 45 to go home, um, everything was fine up until I get midway to 59 it's like, you know, cars started to slow down, so I didn't know what was going on. You know, it started to slow down, and, I hit, and then just, everything just backed up, traffic backed up, and it was, it was just one of the worst traffic scenes I have ever seen. I mean, and it's just to show, you know, how people, personalities start to change. Yeah. You get to see a different, angry person. Everybody's under stress. You know, everyone is feeling the stress. And trying to hump, bump, 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 come on, bump, 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 bump. It's not going to change anything. Just stop honking. You have to just be patient like everybody else. Yeah. You know, there, there are trucks everywhere, 18-wheeler trucks. You know, big trucks, tankers, you know, they have loads and everything. They frustrated, too, because they're trying to get, you know, get their load delivered to the customer. So they're stressed out, too. But nobody can't move because the traffic is just too, too backed up. It's too heavy. Nobody can go anywhere. Now, I didn't know that it was the storm that had a lot to do with it, but... The constables, they were trying to, you know, trying to get things moving. And then I seen some pink lights. So I had to get over in the, in the, the far lane on the right side because that side was blocked off. So I had thought it was a fatality. That was the first thought that came to my mind. It was a fatality. But it wasn't. Everything was pitch dark. And uh, so, had no idea that this was one of the, I won't say the worst, but it was, it was bad enough. Yeah. It was bad enough because it was complete darkness, couldn't hardly see, people everywhere, flashlights. So, everybody's in panic mode. 
when something like this happens in panic mode. What did the disciples do when the storms came? They woke Jesus up and asked Jesus. They wanted Jesus to calm the situation down. Mm -hmm. And that tells me this is what happens when you have fear. Fear is something you're not ready for. You get into panic mode. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if you're going to die or still be alive because you are worried about your own life, wondering if you're going to get through the storm or not. Yes. Panic mode. And this is the, this is the, the type of world we live in when um, people get stressed out, get an attitude, They'll test your patience. Sometimes, you know, they can do things deliberately to see what kind of reaction they would get out of you. And that's the difference between being a Christian and a non-Christian. Now, I can't say that all the people in that traffic were, were, were not Christians. I don't know that. I don't know that. But we'll say that there's a half, there may be a smaller percentage that may be some Christians in that group then it may not be, you know. But um, so Jesus had been awoken by his disciples. And he told them, ye of little faith, of little faith. What happened to their faith? Yeah, that, that faith was tested during the storm. Now, imagine if Jesus was not on that boat when this happened. What would the disciples have done if Jesus wasn't there? Can you imagine? They would have panicked. They had to try to figure things out because the Lord, if he wasn't with them, it would have been a, a different outcome. Yeah. But they didn't have faith because of fear. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, just a few uh, chapters over. We're still in Matthew. Just a few chapters over to chapter 14. And begin at verse number 22. The Bible says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea. Tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, Is it a ghost? And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So they, they, they you know, they, they want to make sure that it's actually Jesus that's, you know, on the water. And so Peter wanted to make sure that's actually him before he steps out and do the same thing that Jesus has already done. So Peter answered and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, 
He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw when the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. Cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately... Jesus stretched out his hand and called him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, Jesus had given Peter the assurance that it is actually him that is walking on water. So, Jesus' encouraging words to Peter motivated him to do the same When the wind was boisterous, what did Peter do? Well, the Bible's going to tell us what he did. What did Peter do? He allowed fear to override his faith. When Jesus is right there the whole time. When there is fear, then comes doubt. And when there is doubt, there is hesitation. And when there is hesitation, you sink under. The storms, the high winds, doesn't matter. You focus on what's before you. Why doubt the one who has the power to rebuke the wind and obey him? And there is a calmness. So that is the message. Uh, that is the message tonight, and I hope that uh, this message was encouraging uh, to you. A great tempest arose on the sea. What did the disciples do? And we we looked in the scriptures tonight, and we seen what they did. When storms come into our lives, saints, what will we do? Are we going to have fear over our faith in God? Just stand there knowing that with the assurance that Jesus has never left us. He says in the scriptures, he says, for I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now those are words that I don't know if it's not encouraging to you to hear that from Jesus himself. But if I can read and believe that what Jesus is saying, I believe it. I have faith in in those words. Do you have faith in those words also? Whatever Jesus says, Do not doubt his words. Do not doubt what he said he's going to do. He will do it. He will deliver. He always delivers on his promises. Amen. So, do not do what the disciples did when the storm came in that boat. Do not do what Peter did by losing sight of what's before you because Jesus is right there. Do not do what Peter did. He lost sight because he worried about the storms. But he didn't stand firm knowing that Jesus is on the other side waiting for Peter to walk across the water. He's right there. And he slipped and Jesus picked him up. He's right there. All he had to do was believe it that he's not going to forsake him. Just walk on the water. Keep going. Don't worry about the storms. Don't worry about what you're surrounded with. Don't be intimidated by that. But keep going forward because I'm right here. I'm right there with you. So if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you should be. Because by you being outside of the church of Christ that Christ died for, you're living beneath your privileges. There's only one church 
There's only one faith. It's not two faiths. It's not multiple churches. You can only be added to one. You don't join, but you are added. One church. And the first thing an alien sinner must do, he must hear. Hearing. You must hear something. You know, if you heard false doctrine all your life, you need to turn your ear away from that and turn to hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of what you need to do to be saved. What must I hear? You must hear the facts of the gospel. What are the facts? The facts are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. He was buried the third day. He, he was buried, he rose, excuse me, he was buried, but he rose the third day according to the scriptures. You must hear Acts 15 and 7, and you must believe those facts according to Acts 15 and 7. And after you believe what you have heard, you must repent of your sins. Your sins have to be uh, washed away but you have to repent you have to acknowledge that you are a sinner you must repent of your sins Luke 13 3 and 5 you must confess that Jesus Christ on mortal tongue is the son of the living God Matthew 10 32 and after you confess you must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Baptism is what puts you into Christ. You're baptized into his death and you become a new creature in Christ. Mark 16, 15 and 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So baptism is the final step that puts you into Christ into the spiritual kingdom, which is the church of Christ. Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It shows ownership. I mean, my shows ownership. It is only one church. It's plural. One church, one builder, one Christ. So give no tonight. Oh wow.